الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسول الله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث رجالا كثيرا والنساء واتقوا الله تسألون به والارحم ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتون الا وانتم مسلمون واتسموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا ثم اما بعد ان الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين فان استقل هديتي كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واشروا الامور متتتها وكل متتت بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله something different in today's world that we didn't see at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for that reason i put something a little different from what we know of the khutbah the hajj from the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam almost always you'll hear some of what i just said in arabic in the juma khutbah almost always you'll hear at least ya ayyuhalladhina amanu attaqullaha haqqatu qatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun but the imam will stop because that's the end of the ayah but then i continued with part of the next ayah wa attasimu bi hablillahi jami'a wallahu tafarraqu so first i will give you the translation of this and i'll tell you inshallah how this relates to our subject today Islam tomorrow the future of muslims the ayah that you always hear has a meaning in english something like this o oh, you who believe give allah his rights by having taqwa for him which is to put a shield between you and allah's punishment on the day of judgment this is what we usually translate as pious or righteous but taqwa actually is to put up a shield between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on yawm al-qiyam on the day of judgment so it continues and it says and don't die illa except as muslim as believers in islam and followers of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is the meaning behind being a real muslim Why did I add that and how does that apply to my subject today which is Islam tomorrow because the meaning of that next little bit is very very heavy and exactly what Allah tells you don't do I can promise you somebody's going to do it otherwise he wouldn't mention it just as in the very beginning for the Jewish the christians and certainly for the muslims we know that our father adam was tested with one thing what was he tested with don't kill somebody well he was the first person so wasn't nobody to kill anyway don't steal anything how can he steal from anybody everything was all there for him that wasn't the problem about fornication the only woman created was his wife so there's no problem there 
It's one thing. He had in front of him Jannah, the lowest level of Jannah, Aden or Eden. He could eat, he could drink anything he wants from Jannah. Except one thing. Don't eat the fruit from such and such tree. When I was a Christian, I heard this pondered by some of the priests and the preachers and pastors. They talked about this subject. What did it mean? Some of them said, well, it meant don't have sex. Which is really stupid. Because there was only two people there. <laughs> some said that it, it indicated that they were naked, which comes up later. Some said it was just symbolic. Some even said it wasn't really a tree at all. It was just don't sin in general. They had a lot of opinions about it. Maybe some of you have thought about this question. Why? Why? Because Adam and Eve ate from a tree. How did that bring such big sin into the world? Christians are really consumed with this idea about sinning and salvation because their salvation really hangs on a pretty thin thread admitted by their own Bible that if Jesus on the cross is not real they don't have a plan of salvation. That's what it says. Paul said it. If Jesus on the cross isn't right then everything we're preaching is false. Well guess what? Take another look at that. Adam and Eve. In the, in the best place. They were created in the best place. Now their shaitan is there. The devil is there. We know that. That's in their Bible. The interesting part about it is, in Islam it's clear that both Adam and Eve, both of them, they sinned, they broke a covenant here by eating from the tree. It's clear they both did it. In Islam we know that they're equally responsible, equally they made tawbah, equally they were forgiven. Simple story. Very simple. And then Allah took them out of the paradise, put them on the earth, and that's pretty much how it went. In the book of Genesis, in the Bible, it clearly states that the woman is cursed even today because of Eve, what she did, and it's her fault, and blames her. And the last time I was here, we talked about the blame gun, and exactly that's how it starts, blaming other people for your mistakes. She is blamed clearly, not just by word, but extension, going on to say that not only is she cursed, her monthly cycle is a curse on her. Having pains in childbirth is a pain, a, a um, curse on her, these pains. All of this is a curse on her. And then her children are cursed because of her sins. So suddenly the sin of Adam is carried forward on generation upon generation. And then the uh, only thing that's going to cure that up is slaughtering an animal. And the blood of that animal is going to have to pay for eating the fruit. Well, that gets pretty expensive if you stop and think about that. And this continued on for so many generations that people were making money out of this. We're talking about thousands, millenniums. We're talking many years. And when people wanted to slaughter, it had to be such and such and so and so. And by the way, the priests were the only ones that happened to have exactly what you needed, but it was going to cost you some money then you could be forgiven. Another thing that went along with that was if you brought the wrong kind of money, it couldn't be used in the temple. You have to change the money over here for this money. And I don't know if some of you have had this experience. I don't, you probably never had to change any money in your life, did you? Never had trade currency, did you? <laughs> we do it all the time. And we know when you trade, you're going to lose part of your values, true? Well, there was no exception back then. According to the New Testament, it said Jesus drove these money changers out of the temple. For doing what? Made them, number one, made them buy these animals that they had. These are sacred animals. These are pure animals. Yours aren't. And 
you have to use this money that we have, and we're not going to give you full value for it. So we'll get you twice. Once when you change the money, and then once when you buy the animal. This is what, read the Bible, this is what it says. For us. We don't have this problem. Because there was no extension here. Adam sinned. Yes. Eve sinned. Yes. Both of them made tawbah. They repented to Allah. Allah, I made the sin. I'm sorry. They cried about it. They asked Allah to forgive them. And they never did it again. So therefore, they were forgiven. Simple as that. Simple. And it's logical. It doesn't mess up your mind. It doesn't make you start thinking, okay, what kind of God is this? He's uh, mad because... And then we have to... I can't get it. Confusing. Islam is very clear. Everything in Islam is straight. You can understand it if you want to. And how does this apply to our subject today? I want you to look back one more time at this subject. Why is it that Allah said, don't eat from the tree? Was it because Allah wanted that tree for something he was going to eat later? No. Allah doesn't eat food. Allah has no needs of this creation. So why did he tell him that? Why was that order there from the beginning? Why did Allah create a tree there that he didn't want him to eat? If it's paradise, that's strange, isn't it? This is before we get into the subject of the devil tempting him and all the rest of it. As a Muslim, I think everybody here is ready to just tell me all in one voice. Because it's a test. We know this life is a test. Again, it's very easy to understand, isn't it? You're born, and then you die. And in between, you do stuff. What are you going to be asked about? You won't be asked about being born, because the law caused that to happen. And you're not going to be asked about how you died, unless you did it to yourself, because the law is going to cause that to happen. But what's in between is what you're going to be asked about, true or false. That's your test, isn't it? Because if there's no test, then you should just keep on living forever. But you don't. Everybody dies. Kala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kullu nafsin dayakatil mot. Every single soul will taste death. You can't get around it. I can't get around it. No matter how you try. No matter how you plan ahead with health insurance. No matter how many people you know that are doctors that can fix stuff that breaks. You're going to die. And you're going to be seriously asked about every single thing that you did in this life. So you can party now, but the day of payment is going to show up, and then what will you do? This is why Muslims are so careful in some of the smallest details of their life, because they know they're going to be asked about it. It's easy for me to say this because I've seen so many Muslims in so many countries. I will tell you, the Muslims, even today, are still the most conscientious about their belief and about their religion. Even the ones with big mistakes. I was told that in one country, an Arab country, that even when these Haramis, guys that steal stuff, before they go out to steal, they say, Tawakal to Allah, let's go. But it doesn't mean it's good. It just means this is how even subconsciously they're going to think before they do anything about Almighty God. And obviously they didn't think about it very deep or they wouldn't steal stuff. The point is though, on the tip of the tongue of the Muslim hangs the word Allah. Ask any Muslim, anywhere, anytime, how's it going? How you doing? What's up? How's the family? What will be the automatic answer? Even if he has the worst problem or just had the best experience, he's still going to start with these words. Alhamdulillah. When I was a Christian, we used to hear some people, the born-again Christians, say, praise God, praise God. We used to hear that. Sometimes. 
But from the Muslim, he's saying all the, all the praise, all the worship is only for Allah many times a day. Maybe even in the thousands of times, every single day, Muslims are saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I'm happy, Alhamdulillah. I'm not happy, Alhamdulillah. It's still the same answer, and this is a good sign. Now we come to, why, Yusuf, did you add the next part of that ayah in Surah Al-Imran? Why did you do that? Well, how, did, how does that work? How do I relate to that? Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about that. So don't go away. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabbi ajma'in Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, hu ala adhi jahannam muslimin In the first khutbah, I was talking about very clear proof that this life is a test. Everything about this life is a test. But Allah did not leave us. Allah did not leave us without the curriculum, without the material for us to study for this test. He made it clearly available to us in a number of forms. First and foremost, Allah gave you aql. Everybody has aql. Your own brain, your understanding. He gave all of us the ability to think. And the ability to think only came from Allah. The knowledge that we have came from Him. I'm mixed two eyes together. This is in Surah Baqarah, ayah number 255 from Ayatul Kursi. Allah tells us He has all the knowledge of everything in the universe. You don't have any knowledge except it came from Him. Plus or minus translation. So, if I understand this, if I understand that all this knowledge is coming from Him, I realize now that it's up to Him to give me what I need to get through this test. Second thing that He gave us, He gave us the ability to choose. He gave you this ability to choose. You can choose right or wrong. And people will tell you there are many choices on a subject. You know, you could go in many directions. But in reality, there's really only one direction. Al-Haq, the absolute truth. Any other direction you take will be wrong. So that's pretty simple too, isn't it? When guidance comes to you, you will see one path which is clear you'll see the one you should take. But there may be a lot of other paths, but not any other one is going to be right. Just that one. And that's the path called the Sirat the Mustaqim. Go back and look. Allah tells us, and we say this many times every day, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ It's you, Allah, that we are worshipping. And it's you, Allah, that we ask for guidance. mustaqim, <laughs> guide us. Edina, us, plural. On the sirat, singular, mustaqim. So there really is only one sirat, only one way. There's all of us in one way. Anything else you choose, it's not going to work. So stop saying, oh, this guy's real nice, he does a lot of good deeds, he just doesn't believe in the law. How come he can't go to paradise? Stop saying that. Allah has made this very clear, and he's given everybody the same chance. The problem is that some people have rejected it. They don't want it. 
And if you try to tell them, they're not going to accept it. It's as simple as that. None of us as Muslims are allowed to force Islam on anybody. Nor has it ever really been possible. It's impossible. And it's also not permitted. About that, first we look at the word Islam. It contains within it a word in Arabic, sincerity. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. Sincerity is there. How do you convince anybody to be sincere? By force. Can you do that? Put a gun to somebody's head and say, you better be sincere. Oh yeah, you betcha I'm being sincere. <laughs> say whatever you want me to say. But as soon as you take the gun away, you'll go back to whatever you did before. The same with the sword. They say Islam spread by the sword. How do you spread sincerity by a sword or any other weapon? You can't. It's not sincere. Sincere comes from the individual. It is from their own heart. And there is nothing you or I can do. Even Allah does not force them. Look at what he says in the next ayah in Surah Baqarah. La ikraha fid deen. He's telling you there is no forcing or compulsion in the deen of Allah. And he continues by what means in the English that the way is clear. The way is clear now for you look at it. And whoever accepts the iman and Allah, they chose the right way. But whoever continued in the false worship, the tagut, they're the losers. This is real loose translation, but you read it, you'll see it. And this is coming after Ayatul Kursi. You have to put it together to understand clearly, if you really want to, that Allah is telling you who He is and who He isn't. Once you understand who He is and who He isn't, the logical conclusion will be in front of you. If you accept there's a Creator and a Sustainer, then who created you? Should you say thank you? And who sustains you every day? Should you say thank you? And we're right back to our subject. How do you say thank you to Allah in Arabic? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Hu Allah di jamla muslimin. Now you're going to come back and say, well wait a minute. Alhamdulillah, thanks a lot for that. But you still didn't tell us why you added that little bit in the first part of the Jummah. When you said, wa atasimu bi ablilahi jamia. Wallah to farqo. Well now is the time we're going to find out. Look at the meaning of it. After Allah put such a pressure on you by saying, don't die except in Islam. Don't die except as a Muslim. No matter what happens, don't die unless you're on this straight path. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And so it starts with wa. Pay attention. It's starting with wa. It means and. So keep reading. Wa atasimu bi hablilahi jami'a. Hold tight, all of you, to the rope of Allah. How? Jimia! Together. How? Together, together, together. Wallah tafaraku. And don't separate. Don't separate. Is this a danger to us today in this world? Have the Muslims separated? Have we separated from each other? Have we separated from our families? Have we separated from our brothers and sisters in Islam? Have we separated in our masajid across the world today? Have we divided up into groups? And have we come up with different belief systems, even to the extent that some believe that about Allah, but others believe about something else? We have six pillars of faith in Islam that are mandated by Almighty God, that without which, if you have even one missing, it's not Islam anymore. The first is to believe in Allah. وَمَلَايَكَتِهِ وَكَتُوبِهِ وَرِسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمُ الْآثَرِ وَقَدُتُ اللَّهِ It is to believe in the oneness of Allah and all that goes with that in this could take volumes. To believe in Allah is just a word but whenever you read the volumes you'll understand more. A website we put up for this purpose has made a huge difference in the English language to the people of the West non-Muslims when they saw it. Because in the search engines, when you used to type God space Allah, you would get attack after attack after attack. And they're all still there today, except one. The number one 
answer comes back from our website, GodAllah.com. And on there you will find what it is we really believe and don't believe about the one Almighty God. And it answers the questions for Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, whoever wants to look and understand, it's there. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The next thing, we believe in the angels. Okay, you say you believe in angels. What do you believe about angels? Well, number one, you can't see them. They're made from light. Along the way, it's not mentioned in the belief system, but when you go into details, you find right away the belief in the jinn, and they're made from a smokeless fire. We believe in the books. How do we believe in the books? I, I'm surprised how many Muslims send me emails asking me, about the Bible, because they want to study the Bible, they said, well, we believe in it, so we should learn it. I said, what? What? Who is teaching you Islam? There isn't anything left of the Bible on the planet. What you're reading is translations of mistakes that people thought about a book that they're not even sure exists. The names Matthew, Mark, Luke... The first three synoptic gospels, these are made up hundred years after Jesus was gone. The books were there with a letter on them, but they want to make it more personal, so they came up with these names. That's a fact. So how are you going to go in here and you're going to say, well, maybe this, maybe that, something else, and you don't even know the Quran yet. You haven't even memorized the Quran and you're going to talk about somebody else's books. And they're definitely not the books that we're believing in. We're believing in the original books that came from Allah to those prophets for their time. Period. Best. Finish. Halas. Don't go there. Of course we believe in the last book. Do you want to know what the Bible said? Read the Quran. Allah tells you what He revealed for the people before. And it's in their language. You don't even have to think about it. There. That's what Allah said. He said that. He said this. He said that. You want to know? There it is. And you don't need to argue with these people about a book that doesn't exist. Tell them what you have, not what they don't have. Let them figure it out. Remember, it's their choice. What's the next thing? We believe in the messengers. What do we believe about them? Now that much I'm sure you know. We believe that all the messengers of Allah were the highest of people of their times, the best examples that there were for the community, and at the same time, they were not God. None of our prophets were God or had gods inside of them or were so close to God that they were turning into light or anything else. They were human beings like you and I. They ate food. They went to the bathroom. They made normal mistakes just like you and I. They just didn't make the big mistakes. And we believe in the resurrection that you will be brought back in a full body. A body, you know, flesh, bones, eyes, nose, mouth, ears. You'll have everything when you're brought back on the Day of Judgment. And that same body is what's going to testify against you on the Day of Judgment. You know what he made me do, and the body's going to tell it all. The prosecuting attorney in your case in court on the Day of Judgment is you, your body. Don't forget that. Then, this one is the problem. And the Prophet ﷺ told us this was going to be the problem. In the last days, we find that's exactly true. The Qadr of Allah. As he predicted, it has happened. Muslims argue about this subject maybe more than anything else. Even some so-called scholars, so-called wannabe presenters of Islam have made big mistakes in this area, the Qadr of Allah. I can give you a whole khutbah on this subject because comparing from the Greeks and Romans and what they said, the Jews, what they said, Christians, what they're saying today, and then of course what Islam teaches, you'd be surprised. A whole world of misbelief comes out of misunderstanding the Qadr of Allah. Everything with Allah is already a done deal. It is already written. It will happen. Nothing you and I are going to do to change what Allah wants to happen. Nothing. 
Now, get one little thing in your head so you understand this. If something was coming to you that was bad, really bad, but you made a dua or you did some good deed, then it would be diverted away from you. We understand that. How do we understand it? We understand that Allah already knew all of that before it ever happened. You didn't know. In fact, we don't know half of what's going around us, but Allah knows all of it. So all of it is known to Allah. Even that you were so bad that you almost went to hell, a'udhu billah, but then at the last minute you did those deeds of righteousness, Allah saved you. And you can say, wow, just because of this or that, but Allah already knew it. That's the qadr. Allah knows, simple sentence, Allah knows and you don't. These points are very critical because this is where shaitan comes to confuse the believers and it's one of the places that Muslims begin to divide up or actually they use it as an excuse to divide because they wanted to divide up anyway. Ego, the nafs of the individual, of the believer, is his biggest problem. Yes or no? Now, the biggest enemy, enemy of all of the enemies that we have is who? Ourself. Shaitan is for sure the instigator and he'll do everything he can to help you make the wrong decision. But the bottom line is, you made the decision. Shaitan never forced anybody. Never. You made the choice. He made it attractive. You bought it. So we can't blame him or anybody else. Just ourselves. The idea of the Muslims dividing up, and this has happened, this has already happened, Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Our Prophet wasallam was a real prophet of the real God with a real message. It's not bogus. It's not a joke. It is clear. How could any man stand in front of his congregation 1400 years ago and tell you exactly what would happen unless he was a true prophet? Especially when he tells you the negative things that you will do. And we're doing it. Because if he was a real salesman trying to sell something he made up, he will tell you, yeah, just get my religion, it'll be easy. Allah said in the Quran, no, it won't be easy. When people come into Islam, Allah said, good human beings think they'll be left alone on saying we believe and they won't be put into a great fitna. Just like the people before them were put into the great fitna by Allah, so that we will see who are the ones doing the truth and who are the liars. And yet Allah already knows that too. Mm. So he didn't promise it was going to be easy. And then it continues telling us in Islam in the last day exactly how it would be. A good salesman would tell you, yeah, in the, at the end it'll be so nice and rosy. Everybody will be, you know, having love for each other. The lion will lay down with the lamb and it's going to be so easy. Do you see anything like that today? Huh? No, that's Christianity that promised me that. Now, after Isa alayhi salam comes, yes, that's known, but that hasn't happened yet. This, our point about Islam tomorrow, the future of Muslims today, is understood here real clear with a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, As the Yahudi, the Jews, one Nasari, the Christians, have divided Faraka into 71 or 72 sects or groups, you Muslims, you're going to divide into 73. The meaning from the Arabic idiom here isn't by numbers. It's by meaning no matter how much the Jews divide, Christians will divide more. No matter how much the Christians divide, the Muslims will divide more. So don't worry about counting how many groups there are on the earth today. Some brothers are doing that. Oh, it's 72, 72. Hey, wait a minute. I got 82. How did that happen? Huh? Because that wasn't the meaning. One brother came to me one time, he said, Sheikh, I think it's the last days. I said, why? 
He said, I counted 72 groups. I said, which masjid? Because that's how bad we've become. We have divided up like that, exactly like our Prophet ﷺ said. And then he said, Kullu, all of them, Finnar. All of these groups, every single one of these groups is going to hell. Illa wahid. Except for one. The one that me and my companions are on today. And what was the name of their group? I want you to pay close attention to this. Because the name of that group is the name of the group that's saved on the Day of Judgment. And it doesn't rhyme with goofy or goony. And I think you would know what I'm talking about exactly. It doesn't rhyme with anything other than what? Muslim. In Quran, Allah said about these people, they declare themselves to be on what? On Islam. Verily, with Allah, the only way, the way is the deen. Deen means way, is Islam. In a deen, in the law, Islam. True or false? Allah said it. وَمَمْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرُ الْإِسْلَامَ الدِّينَ فَلَا يُقْبَلَا مِنْهُمْ وَهُوَ فِي الْأَخِيرِ دِينَ الْقَاسِرِينَ Here Allah is telling you in the same chapter, chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 85, whoever wants a way other than what Allah prescribed for them, Islam, they will, Allah will not accept it, and they will be with the losers. Allah is going to reject it. How does this stack up? Take a look. One more hadith. We'll wrap it up with this. I want you to think carefully. The Prophet ﷺ told his companions 1400 years ago that in the last days the enemies of Islam would come to the Muslims and invite other people to come to the Muslims to attack in the same way that you invite people to come to eat. Hey, come on over, we're eating. Hey, come on over, having a feast. Hey, you don't want to miss this. Got chicken, man. Hey, lamb, you like goat? Come on over. Hey, right? Do we see that today? Are the enemies of Islam joining together, going in and invading Muslims? Yes or no? And look, at that time, one believer could fight against ten. Ten fought against a hundred. A hundred fought against a thousand. This was known again and again and again. The Muslims had victory, yet they were outnumbered. So that was the natural reason why the Sahabi asked him, Is it because we're going to be so few in number? Kala Rasul Sallallahu that. Nope. It will be because... What? Habadunya, the love of this material world and the fear of death. In fact, in the same hadith, he told them that we're going to be scattered all over the world like scum on top of a flood. We're going to be everywhere. Are Muslims everywhere today? Are we? You can hardly find any place on the planet except somebody's a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. In South America, Islam is spreading very rapidly. Did you know that? And there's a lot of so-called Muslims in our so-called Muslim countries today. We know about that. Many of them didn't even come from Juma today. But they still call themselves Muslims, right? And what's the condition of us today? We love the material world so much and we're afraid to die. Has that happened? Because if you can ask yourself that honest question and give the honest answer, you'll understand where the future of Islam is for us. The Islam for tomorrow is up to us right now today. And if you said, yeah, wait a minute, but Allah already knows. Huh, we know He knows. We're not going to be asked on the Day of Judgment about what Allah knows. We're going to be asked about what we intended to do. Is it important in Islam for us to share the message? Ask yourself that question. Do I need to know my religion? Ask yourself that question. How will you know your religion, the real religion of the real Islam? 
And how will you share that with your own family, your mother, your brother, your wife, your children? How will you share that message? You need to know, I need to know, and we need to share it. How will we do it? Carrier pigeons? People used to use that. At the time of Napoleon, they used birds, and they put a message on it and release it. It would fly back home, and when they got it, they could open up the message and know what's going on out on the front where the war is going on. Pretty good deal, huh? Takes a little while, and if anybody's hungry along the way and shoots your bird down, the message doesn't get there, does it? Today we have communication in front of us like never before in the history of the world. Our problem is today exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. We love this dunya so much and we're so afraid of death, we don't even start to think how easy it would be for us to communicate this message. Most of our youth today use the internet and they know what Facebook is. And they use it, but not for Islam. Most of our wives and our children know how to do text messaging. Probably most of us know how to use text messaging on a phone. And we use it all the time, but not to share Islam. The internet, text messaging, television, alhamdulillah, that we finally, and I've been begging Muslims, I'm 20 years old this, this year, and next month makes exactly 20 years in Islam. And from day one, I've been begging the Muslims, please, please get this message out to these people. Please tell these non-Muslims, please tell them in the English language, what is the message of Islam? Because when they hear it, they stop. They stop everything. They freeze. They're like, huh? What? Because it's the fitra. It is what they were born on to start with. They left it. You're calling them back to what they started with. The belief that there is God, you have to do what he wants you to do on his terms. Simple as that. And it's only this year in my 20th year in Islam, that Allah blessed us to give us another tool. We got the satellite to broadcast this message all over the United States and Canada. And what we're doing right now here today, just in a few hours, inshallah, this will be shown all over the United States and Canada on Guide Us TV. Alhamdulillah. Within two months, Allah gave us two more satellites. We now have three satellites broadcasting 24 hours a day nothing except Islam no commercials no subscription watch it free and already people are making shahada and already and of course it, <laughs> you already know that the enemies of Islam are watching it the politicians the military all these guys are watching the channel seeing what we're going to say next some are even concerned maybe we're going to start some big problem in the United States I don't want to cause any problem. In fact, I want to help them solve problems. And Islam is there for solutions. The solution to every single problem lies within one of the most beautiful statements you or I could ever make. It is the number one statement of the universe. This is the solution to every single problem. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And a statement that goes with it, confirms it, and shows you what to do about the statement, Muhammad Rasulullah. And this will be the subject for another khutbah at another time. But for now, we're going to pray and we're going to ask Almighty Allah to wake us up, to cause us to be of those people who recognize the time we live in, and to prepare for that last day, to prepare for Isa salam when he comes, to prepare ourselves against the fitna of the Dajjal. One of the things Prophet salam and all of his companions always talked about on the Juma khutbah, on the mimbar, was this fitna of the Dajjal, and one of the signs of the last day is the Khatib won't do that anymore. And we find hardly anybody mentions it. So we ask Allah, wake us up. Allah guide us. Idina Suratu Mustaqim.
guide us, guide us, guide us, guide us, guide the people, guide the human beings, guide all the people around this world to this beautiful teaching. There is only one God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Amin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan wa fil akhirati hasan wa kina adhaban nar. Rabbana la tuzig kulubana badda idha daytana wa hablana min landuka rahma in akhanta wa ha. Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathirin wa la yabfru dhunuba illa ant. Fadfurli magfurti min indika wa hanna in akhanta wa furrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Kama salli ala Ibrahim. وعلى آل إبراهيم إن أخاهم الله المجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت آل إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إن أخاهم الله المجيد إن الحمد لله رب العالمين والله جل المسلمين إكما سلام